Draw us closer to you. And we thank you for this in Jesus' name. And all God's people say, amen. You may be seated. Perhaps many of you here in the room are familiar with the name Julie Andrews, Mary Poppins, Sound of Music. My kids were growing up back in the old, man, that dates us, man, back in the old videotape days, amen? They'd watch Sound of Music all the time. We'd have the music rehearsed and memorized. Julie Andrews had this way, if you ever watched The Sound of Music, she'd come out and she'd do the spinning thing, the heels are alive with The Sound of Music. She had a way with her voice because she was able to to touch on all, I guess they called all four octaves. And she just had this beautiful, beautiful voice, just very, just, uh, very, very, um, just in a way that could capture your attention. 1997, Miss Andrews was having some trouble with her voice. She couldn't hit certain ranges, and so she went in to see some ear, nose, throat specialists. They told her, you have something very common that happens to people that use their vocal cords a lot and stretch it, and they said, you've got a very severe inflammation, and because of the inflammation, you've grown a nodule in your vocal cord. They discussed with her the options of what to do with that nodule, they said, very common procedure, that we can remove it, you let your voice rest, and you recover. I've had several preacher friends that have done that. Dr. Getch, who preached with us, he had that about five or six years ago. He had a nodule in his voice and had it removed, and praise God, it hasn't affected his preaching. Julie Andrews thought about all the options. She went and had the surgery, but unfortunately, when she woke up out of the surgery, they found out that her vocal cords had been damaged. She would never be able to sing like she once did. They asked Julie Andrews, what do you think about what happened to you? And she said, I was in depression. I felt like I lost my identity. Some of you have had laryngitis. Laryngitis could be short-term. It could be chronic. When your vocal cords are inflamed, you can't talk. Might be a whisper. I've had that several times where I allergies or something and can't speak. It typically happens on a Tuesday or Saturday, and I come to the pulpit, I'm struggling. Some of you might remember some of those services where I just really struggled. For a preacher, of course, or someone who sings, if you use your voice, that's very important. You don't want to lose your voice. This morning, we're looking at a man who was a priest. He came from a great ancestry. He descended from the priesthood of Abiah. A man who had a great marriage, a man who was greatly respected, a man who'd been given a prophetic announcement, but we're told he lost his voice. Not only did he lose his voice, but he was silent, he was dumb, he was speechless for nine months. But thankfully, he got his voice back. And when he got his voice back, I imagine his wife Elizabeth and her cousins and her neighbors and everyone who lived in the Judean hillside probably said something this, like this, though it's not recorded in Scripture. They probably said, that's Zacharias or Zach, it's so good to hear your voice. I have a preacher friend over in the Philippines that is a good friend of mine. Normally this time of year I would go over to preach for them. They're having their, their, big, their big time. And we'll talk one or two times during the year. He'll call me on WhatsApp or Viber, and I'll call him back. Or now we use Signal, and he'll call back, and, and uh, he'll call me, and I'll hear his voice. I'll say, Preacher, it's so good to hear your voice. I have another pastor friend that's, that ministers in a restricted access nation and used to bring him here God, every, every year for, you know, for several consecutive years. Then the pandemic came, and we just haven't been able to be in contact. But we've talked a couple times by, by phone. And last year, I think it was probably about August, or so we talked by phone. I said, hey, preacher, it's so good to hear your voice. So good to see people's faces, but when you haven't heard their voice for a long time, it's good to hear their voice. Zacharias is a man we're going to study today that gets his voice back, and I'm sure everyone said it's good to hear your voice. Notice some things about Zacharias this morning. Number one, would you consider, we see Zacharias the skeptic. 
We have to go back to the early part of Luke chapter 1 to understand that Zacharias was, it was his lot, it was his turn to offer incense, which is a picture of prayer, inside the temple. Zacharias goes inside, he offers the incense, he's standing at the altar, people are on the outside, and he looks to his right side, and God sent one of his great archangels by the name of Gabriel. Gabriel's name means the man of God. Gabriel gave him a profound, wonderful announcement. He said, your prayer has been heard, your prayer is answered. You and your wife have been praying for many years for a son, for a child. I've got good news for you. You are biologically and humanly unable to bear children according to age, but I want to tell you, you're going to have a son. And then Gabriel went on and told him about the uniqueness of this son. He said, I'm going to tell you what your son's profession will be. And I'm going to tell you what your son will do. And I'm going to tell you how your son's going to impact his generation. I'm going to tell you that your son is a fulfillment of what the Bible says about a man who will come to prepare the way for the Lord Jesus Christ. According to Isaiah chapter 40, Malachi chapter 3 and 4. And you have to stop for a moment and read verses 13 to, I guess, verse 17 to catch and just meditate on for a minute the powerfulness of this message. It was a message from God. Zacharias did not receive that message with enthusiasm. I want to encourage you this morning, brother and sister in Christ, whenever God speaks, we better receive it with enthusiasm. Amen. We ought to be excited about hearing from God. He wasn't excited that he heard from God. And we find that Zacharias receives this message and notice the disclosure. The very last thing told to him, well, notice something said to him. He said, you're going to have a son in verse 13, and his name shall be called John. Now, God was rewriting everything in Zechariah's life because, as we'll see later on, if a man had a son, it was just declared that his son would be named after the father. But he was going to have a son that would have a profound place in history. He said later on, listen, I'm going to tell you about your son. He should be great in the sight of the Lord. I want to tell you about your son. He should neither drink neither wine nor strong drink. Basically, he's telling him a fulfillment of Numbers chapter 6 that his son would come and be a Nazarite separated to the Lord. He said, I want to tell you something else about your son. He will be filled with the Holy Ghost, even from his mother's womb. And boy, Zacharias is just getting, wow, what what kind of baby is this going to be? He tells in verse 16, he should turn the hearts of the children of Israel from the the sons to the father and fathers to the son, and he'll come in the spirit and power of Elias. He gets this disclosure from God. Oh, it's great news when a woman finds out she's going to have a baby. Especially it's the first baby. It's great news when she does the early pregnancy test and she tells her husband to turn the color, we're going to have a child. It's great news when they go see the doctor for the very first time. The doctor checks around and confirms she's going to have a child. There's excitement. There's, there's wonderfulness. But I want to tell us this morning something today. Babies don't stay as Babies. Babies become toddlers, and toddlers become children. Children become teens, and like Mark Twain said, when they become a teenager, put them in a big barrel, put a cover over it, put a hole in it, just feed them through the hole for the next 10 years. Then they become adults. And I want to just say, because we have a lot of young families, a lot of young babies and children, I remind you today that the greatest thing God gifted in your marriage next to your marriage is that baby. E.T. E. T. Sullivan said this, the greatest forces in the world are not earthquakes or thunderbolts. The greatest force in the world are babies. The Bible says that the, the Lord says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain, they build it. And the Bible says the children are the heritage of the Lord and the fruit of the womb is his reward. The Bible says the barren mother shall be the joyful mother of children. 
Listen, say, salve, just take advantage of the fact that God has given you babies. Don't waste the opportunity. Bless their, bless, be blessed by God. Use it, your opportunity for raising them according to the biblical laws that God has given us of parenting. Listen, there's so many things to be said. I was thinking about this message earlier this week, and the Lord put in my heart about 10 principles I feel really important that we need to teach our young families about raising their children, things about bonding and things about birthing and bonding and things about their about belief and things about boundaries and all of those types of things that are important for children to learn. Don't blow the opportunity of raising your children for the Lord. He was given a disclosure, but we see his disbelief. His reaction to this pronouncement is found in verse 18. As we read verse 18 and we look at verse 20 22, we see apprehension is disbelief. He said this, he said, whereby shall I know this? Now, you have to remember, God sent an archangel to him. And this archangel brought the authority of God's word into his life. And by the virtue of fact, he had God's word. That's all he needed. Can I tell you this morning that as long as you got God's word for your life, you have all the authority that you need for your life. But Zacharias is a Jew, and the Jews require a sign. The Jews were very hard to convince of things, and so he hears this message. He sees this divine appearance. He gets a divine articulation from God, but he's not convinced in his heart that he's got a message from God. He said, how shall I know this? In other words, he was saying this, show me a sign. Show me a sign. You know, some of us read the word of God and we're taught about faith and we're taught about God is great and God is above all things and God is great and powerful and God is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think and God is, God is able to answer our prayers and God, God can do things that we cannot do because that's why we pray. But sometimes we know all these things in our head and then we ask the question, show me a sign. How should this be? When there's apprehension, we're really saying, God, are you for real? Come on, God. Is this really real? Well, there's apprehension, disbelief. I want you to notice something else. There was an absence in his disbelief. He said, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife well stricken in years. He did not believe that God was greater than his human weakness. You get those sad news from the doctor, you've got this. Or you get a pink slip, you don't have a job anymore. Or something devastating that comes out of nowhere comes to you and you're just alarmed by it. Many of you probably had that this week, just something came out. And did you ever notice our reaction to that? We act as if our problem is bigger than God. We think the job loss is bigger than Jesus. And we think that, you know, the sickness is bigger than God. He said, I'm an old man and well stricken in years. There was an absence of faith. I mean, he had the precedent of Abraham and Sarah from the Old Testament in the book of Genesis where he heard about, where he knew, and every Jew knew this because they were well acquainted with Abraham and Sarah and how God appeared to Abraham and Sarah at the age of 75 and for Abraham and 65 for her. And the Bible says that she was barren and they couldn't have children. And now they are 100 and, and he's 100 and she's 90 and she gives birth to a child. He'd forgotten that the Apostle Paul had written later on about the faith of Abraham. He said, you know, Abraham he and, and, his, and his wife, their bodies were as good as dead. They were physically unable to have children. But the Bible says, he staggered not at the promises. He was strong in faith, not staggering in the promises, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Hey, listen, Zacharias had the precedent of Abraham and Sarah that Abraham, in spite of the fact his body was as good as dead, he did not stagger at the promise, but he was strong in faith, giving glory to God. When there's an absence of faith, God is nowhere to be found. When there's an absence of faith, souls can't be won. When there's an absence of faith, prayers are not answered. When there's an absence of faith, there's unnecessary delays. When there's an absence of faith, we cannot please God. 
And if you're watching this morning by live stream and you're here this morning in person, may I tell you this today, that where there's an absence of faith and you're not saved, you can spend all of eternity in hell without Jesus Christ. The greatest sin is not the sin of murder. The greatest sin is not the sin of stealing. The greatest sin is not believing that Jesus Christ died for your sins and rose again from the dead. He that believeth not is condemned already. We see Zacharias, the skeptic, but notice, if you would, secondly, the angel responds to him We see Zacharias in his silence. He expresses his unbelief. I'm reminded Spurgeon said, unbelief will destroy the best of us. Horatius Bonar said, there's nothing so hardening as unbelief. And one great reason for this is that there's nothing so deceitful as unbelief. His heart is filled with unbelief. He doubts the promise of God. He doubts what God says is going to happen to his family, to his home. God said, I've heard your prayer. I've answered your prayer. He said, I don't believe any of it. And so God deals with him with discipline. Part of good parenting, in fact, biblical parenting, includes discipline, chastening, Discipline or chastening is, because, is not punishment because we're angry with a child or God is angry with us. Discipline and chastening are meant to correct disobedience and rebellion and to lovingly correct bad behavior. The Bible says, for whom the Lord loveth, he chasteneth. And every now and then, God will have to send a difficulty in our life to discipline us, to get us back to prayer, maybe to get us back to church, to get us back to a good spirit, to get us back to the word of God. God told Zacharias, he says, Zacharias, verse 20, thou shalt be dumb and not able to speak. Until the day that these things shall be performed, because thou believest not my word. Now, if the Lord is disciplining, there's the hand of the Lord is applied discipline or chase your life. I'm encouraged today, despise not thou the chastening of our Lord. God has his time and his place. We use that in our life. In his silence, he's disciplined. In his silence, he's disabled. Notice his disability. Four times we read in verse 20, 22, the severity of his disability. The Bible says, thou shalt be dumb, thou shalt not be able to speak. He said in verse 22, he could not speak. The Bible says in verse 22, he remains speechless. I want you to notice certain words. It says, it says in verse 20, he is not able The Bible says in verse 22, he could not. The verse 22 says, he beckoned unto them and he remained speechless. He was, for all practical purposes, disabled. Literally, as you watch his life unfold for the next nine months, Zacharias stood on the sidelines for nine months. You know, where there's an absence of faith, we are on the sidelines. And where there's an absence of faith, we are unable. When there's an absence of faith, we cannot. I remind you today, without faith, it's impossible to please God. I remind you today, there's powerlessness in our disability. Power, unbelief makes us powerless. Unbelief, unbelief closes heaven's doors and heaven's resources to us. Unbelief hinders the work of God from going forward. Unbelief causes people to trip up. There's powerlessness. Notice there's the purpose in this disability. It might be that God chose to have Zacharias silence for nine months because he wanted him maybe more to listen than he would to speak. You know, sometimes God needs to work in our hearts. Maybe he just wants us to be still and know that he's God. When God has us under his word, he wants us to listen He that hath an ear, let him hear. And sometimes all we do is talk. 
All we do is tell God our plans, and all we do is tell God how it's going to be worked out, and our praying really is not praying. A lot of times our praying is telling God how we want it to unfold, when we need to be listening, saying, God, what would you have us to do? Not my will, O Lord, thine be done. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. It might be that the Lord didn't want him to speak for nine months, maybe so that he would not influence other people with his unbelief. Unbelief is contagious. Unbelief is deadening. Oh, they're out to do this again. It's not going to happen. Oh, they're praying for this to happen, but it won't happen. Oh, they have this grand scheme and idea about things not going to. I'm going to tell you this morning that unbelief is very infectious. And belief will do more damage to a congregation like this than the COVID 19 virus will do. Maybe he didn't want him to speak for nine months because he wanted, that was God's way of telling him, I want other people to fear me and to understand that I'm God and I'm in control. When you can't talk, your words are silenced. When you can't talk, your witness is silenced. I remind you this morning, there's a silence. Everyone in this room and everyone watching by live stream, you're going to face and I'm going to face one day. And that silence is called the silence of the grave. When the silence of the grave comes, when life is over, it's too late to say what you should have said. It's too late to say sorry. It's too late to ask for forgiveness. It's too late to say I love you. I remind you this morning where there's a silence of the grave, you'll have no more opportunity to tell somebody about Jesus Christ. I remind you this morning when there's a silence of the grave, your opportunity of praising the Lord, it stops at that moment in this life. The last words have been spoken, whatever they were, pray prayerfully, those last words hopefully were words that honor God. Be silenced. Thou shalt not be able to speak. I shall not talk. For nine months, this man, Zacharias, is silent, and he's watching the miracle of God unfold in the life of Elizabeth. Elizabeth is starting to have physical changes in her body that represents that there's a baby growing inside. He watches as Mary comes around the sixth month of, of Elizabeth's pregnancy, and Mary comes, and they rejoice together. We saw that last week in Mary's song. And Zacharias is here on the sidelines watching all this unfold, not being able to contribute, not being able to say one thing. His mouth is closed. The Bible says he was dumb. He could not speak. He was able to do things. He was on the sideline. I want to tell tell you this morning, brother and sister Christ, there's probably no place worse to be in church and no place worse to be in the Christian life than to be on the sidelines and not being part of what God is doing in his work. When we are in our disbelief, we will not pray. In our disbelief, we will not trust the promises. In our disbelief, we will not step out and get involved. In our disbelief, we don't get involved with the offering. In our disbelief, we won't serve the Lord. There's probably no worse place to be than to be on the sidelines because of unbelief. And so he watches for nine months as these physical changes occur in Elizabeth's life and her life is changing, things are going on, and she's rejoicing, Lord, he can't see a thing. But notice we go a little bit further on and notice verse 57. Elizabeth is about to deliver and Zacharias will have a son. Now Elizabeth full time came that she should be delivered. I love that verse of scripture. It reminds me, we go back to Genesis 18. God told Abraham and Sarah, they said, this is the last time I'm going to tell you. It's like the fifth or sixth time. You're going to have a boy. This boy, he promised him, I'm going to give you a seed. I'm going to give you a son. I'm going to give you the soil, and I'm going to give you a society. You're going to be a great society. That society is now there. They're, they're part of that great society, this great Hebrew nation there. And he's a descendant. John the Baptist would be descended from that great, of that great society there. But here, he's seen this fulfillment here. And he's thinking back to Abraham's day. And it goes back to where the Bible says at age 99, Abraham was told she's going to have a son, and Sarah's 89, and nine months goes by, and we get to chapter 21 of Genesis, and the Bible says, Sarah gave birth to the boy, I'm paraphrasing, she gave birth to the boy, named him Isaac, and it says that God did as God said he would do. 
When God says he's gonna do something, he does it. He's all truth. God cannot lie. God is always on time. You can trust God's word, amen? And we get over to verse 57, and she says, the Bible says she brought forth a son. Now, there's great excitement about this because they kept this a secret. I don't know how you could do that, but they kept it a secret. And word got out that Elizabeth, in her old age, and Zacharias' old age, had a son. And remember, they lived up in the countryside, in the Judean hillside. They kind of just kind of kept, kept things quiet there. Word got out. Her cousins heard. Her neighbors heard. Everybody heard. How could you not be excited? They heard the cry of a little baby boy inside. People heard about it, and so they went around. But Zacharias couldn't tell anybody. He couldn't go knock on doors and tell them that she had a baby. He had no ability to speak. I just he couldn't say anything. But they found out, and they heard. And the Bible says they came, and they recognized in verse 59, that this, verse 58, that this was a supernatural birth. And in verse 58, not only did they recognize it was a supernatural birth, but it was a birth to be celebrated because in verse 58, the Bible says, her neighbors and her cousins heard how the Lord had shown great mercy upon her and they rejoiced with her. When everybody's excited because next to the birthday, Within eight days, a very important day was going to happen. You see, the Hebrews were given a command by God in eight, Genesis chapter 17 of what we call the rite of circumcision. It was establishing as a physical sign the Abrahamic covenant. The Abrahamic covenant, basically God said, I promise that out of you, Abraham, there will be a great nation, a son, a seed, a son, a society, and the land or the soil. And every boy that was born from beginning with Abraham on the eighth day was the day the boy was to be circumcised. Number one was for sanitary reasons. Number two was for spiritual reasons. And the circumcision of the boy represented that he identified the father as the father was the one who did the circumcising. It represented their identification with the covenant God gave to the nation going forward. But it also gave recognition to something even more important. It gave recognition. In fact, we know that there's a Messiah coming. We know that God will send his son. We know that one day we look forward with anticipation for the coming of the Messiah. Of Isaiah 7:14 that a virgin shall conceive and bring forth his son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which is being interpreted God with us. In Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6, unto us a child is born, and unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder. I'm glad this morning, even though the government may not be doing well right now, I'm thankful one day the government will be on the shoulders of our Lord Jesus Christ. And his name shall be called Wonderful and Counselor. Listen, Jesus Christ doesn't need to take a poll among Democrats and Republicans and whatever party may be to find out how he's doing. Because you know what? Everything he does is wonderful. He's counselor. Listen, he's, he's going to be able to give counsel. He gives counsel that never fails and counsel that's always good and counsel that's always positive. He's, his name should be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Prince of Peace, the Everlasting Father. Thank God they, they were recognizing through this rite of circumcision that the baby's identifying with that, that Jesus is coming. Now, the people there did not know this was John the Baptist. And with the circumcision, there was something else that happened. On the day of the circumcision, the boy would receive his name. The name of the son. And so the neighbors and the cousins are excited. And they know what the tradition said. The tradition was that the son would receive the same name as the father. They just thought, well, he's going to get the name Zacharias. He'll be just like his father. And Zacharias is a good name. Zacharias says, my, my God has remembered me. But they, had, they motioned to Elizabeth. And they said, are you going to name him Zacharias? We just assumed his name would be Zacharias. In fact, that's what they said there. The Bible says it came to pass, and on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child. And they, they that his neighbors and cousins, I mean, they were somewhat meddling there. They called him Zacharias after the name of his father. But listen, Elizabeth took her stand because she knew that the promise was given by God to them. And in that promise, there was a precept. And that precept said, you're going to call his name John. We found that in verse 13. And his mother answered and said, no, 
His name should be called John. And they're in amazement, not that the name John was a bad name, and not that the name Zacharias was a bad name or a more preferred name. They just said, this has never been like that in your family. They said, it's never been like, there's none of thy kindred that's called by thy name. But she knew the spiritual significance of the name because she knew a little bit more about the boy than they knew. By the way, let me tell you today, before you stick your nose in other people's business, tell them how to run their kids, they might know a little bit more about their children than you know. And I love what Liz said here. And I love what the attitude they had her. They said, they, she said, no, his name's gonna be John. And so they said, okay, I guess we can't convince her. They said, Zacharias, what do you think? And I love the principle there. You know what the principle is there when they said, they motioned to the father and they said, well, what do you have to say about the Zacharias? You know what they were saying in our terminology? They were saying, let the father decide. Man, I wanna encourage you today. There comes a point in time in your home, in your spiritual life, you've gotta make a decision. You've got to say like Joshua, for me and my house, we'll serve the Lord. Listen, spiritual decision, important decision at your home, be man enough to accept the responsibility you're to make a choice and make a decision for God. It should not be up to your wife to decide, let us serve God. It should not be up to your wife to decide, let, you need to get saved. It should not be up to your wife that you need to go to prayer. You should make the decision. They said, let the father decide. She understood the role of the husband as being the leader in the home. And they turned to Zacharias, and Zacharias Ask for a writing tablet. And he wrote saying, his name is John. And they marveled all. When Jack Zacharias wrote his name was John, something significant happened. Because immediately the, moment, the opportunity he'd been waiting for for nine months and eight days was to be able to make a statement that God, that he'd repented of his sins and that he made a decision that was significant. And the significance was that for nine months he was being chastened for his unbelief. And now in the ninth month, on the eighth day, he's made the decision and he's declaring that where he was once filled with unbelief, now he has great faith in God. And he's saying as he writes down the name John, he says, listen, his name's going to be John, end of decision, nothing more to be said, because God told me that's what his name's going to be. And God said his name is going to mean Jehovah is gracious. And remind you today when that name John was given, it's a reminder to all of us today that the name of Jehovah is gracious and the nature of Jehovah is gracious. I remind you today that the grace of God has appeared to all men. I remind you today for the great, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be made rich. I remind you about the grace of God, for by grace are you saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works as any man should boast. I remind you today, the word grace represents God's riches at God, Christ's expense. When he said his name should be John, he says, I just want you to know, Jehovah is gracious. And this was written by a man who couldn't speak. He just decided that moment in time, I've got faith in God. I've got faith in the promises, and I've got faith in what God can do. And I've got faith in God's power, and I've got faith that God has given me. He says, I have no question in my mind. This is exactly what the angel Gabriel told me is going to happen, and I've had to come a long way to get here, but his name shall be called John. Well, there's the name of the son, but notice the nullifying through the son. The people were amazed. I mean, they're excited. Because they're listening, it's resonating in their mind. Jehovah is gracious. And they asked this question out of amazement. They said, they, they said later on, they said, uh, fear came on all them that dwelt round about them and through these sayings. And they said, what manner of child shall this be? And the Bible says the hand of the Lord was with him. That is upon the, the, this little baby by John. But here's what I want to call your attention to. Look at verse 63 to 64. In verse 63, Zacharias gives indication that he had faith in God. He gives indication he transitioned from unbelief and disbelief to belief in God and faith in God. And, it, and, and people were marveling that he had such great faith and he saw some things that they didn't understand. And immediately he demonstrated faith in God. Faith set him free. Faith opened his mouth. Let me tell you this morning, faith opens doors. 
Let me tell you this morning, faith opens heaven. Let me tell you this morning, faith opens your Christian life. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and rewarder of them that diligently seek him. When he wrote that down, the Bible says immediately in verse 64, it says, his mouth was open immediately and his tongue loose and he spake and he praised God. Listen, when you have faith, it opens things nothing else can open. God repealed Zach's silence and gave him back his voice. And the first thing out of his mouth was, praise God. We pulled out of the parking lot Sunday night last week after Sunday night service. had a great service last Sunday night. We're going to have a great one tonight. They were pulling out. It was just the only ones left were myself, my wife, and Brother Daniel. And we went out first. I pulled to the side there by where our, our dumpsters are. And my wife said, I think you better call Linda now before we get home. She said, just, I think it's better we just talk to her now. She might want to go to sleep early because she has an early morning. Last Monday, this past Monday was her surgery date. Pulled aside. We, I texted her saying, we're going to call. Let me know if you're ready. She said, I'm ready. She got Don, got Christina. They decide we're talking about tomorrow, the, the, the surgery the day following. I said, let's have prayer together. Before we had prayer, bless her heart, Linda said, you know what, I've just resigned in my heart. Whatever God wants, I'm with it. God is good all the time, and all the time God is good. She started weeping on the phone. We didn't say a word, we let her catch herself. And I said, let's go to our Father in heaven. We prayed, you prayed, thank you. Before she went to surgery, I messaged both Don and Linda and said, we're praying for you. It's going to be good. She came out earlier than expected. Don messaged, pastor, doctor messaged me. Surgery went well. They've done an initial sample of the mass. So far they could tell, it doesn't seem like it has any cancer. I said, praise the Lord. Official report's not out. Doctor felt very confident telling them that. A few hours went by, messaged John. I said, Don, is Linda awake and filling up to talking and praying on the phone? He says, I think so. And I was on the phone with Brother Michael. I was on the phone with Brother Michael. We were praying at that time. And I said, Michael, I just, after I pray, I said, Mike, I'm st- I have to cut our time short. I need to, I've only got 15 minutes. Don, Don has to leave the hospital at 7. I said, I got to get on the phone. I want to talk and pray with him. He said, he said that's okay, Pastor. Go ahead. Got on the phone with Linda. Linda was a little bit groggy. Hi, Pastor. Hi, Mrs. Fong. God is good. That's what she said. Amen. Praise the Lord. Amen. I, don't, I don't know the effects of anesthesia it had on her, but I knew it didn't have enough effect to keep her from praising God. Amen. Amen. First thing out of his mouth was praising God. Kenny had a gallbladder surgery on Friday. As soon as he came out, he was able to go home. His wife messaged us, said, he's doing well, praise the Lord. I messaged Kenny later on, and he said, Pastor, I'm home. Praise the Lord, I'm feeling good. First thing out of his mouth, he praised God. I'm going to tell you what's significant. I'm thankful he praised God. I'm thankful he thought about the Lord. I'm thankful the very first thing out of his mouth after nine months of silence was talking to Jesus. And imagine there are those cousins and those neighbors and Elizabeth. They heard his voice just like it sounded before his disablement, before the Lord's silence. It sounded strong. It sounded firm. It was resonating. It had conviction in it. And I imagine as they heard his voice that all of them said together, Zach, it's so good to hear your voice. Zach, it's so good to hear your voice. And I tell you this morning, brother and sister in Christ, that's what God thinks about you and me. That's what God says when there's been a long absence and you haven't talked to Jesus in prayer and you haven't been with him in prayer. But then you realize that time that the Lord needs to hear from you. And you claim Hebrews 4, 16, when it says, let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in need. Can I tell you, our Lord in heaven and the angels of heaven and the great cloud of witnesses in heaven, when they hear your voice, lifted up, they say, it's so good to hear your voice. Amen. 
so good to find and hear the voice of someone who hasn't been in church for a long time. The first time they come back to church, the first thing we do is we start a service. We begin singing praises to God, worshiping the Lord and singing songs like, one day Jesus will come and redeem how I love to proclaim it. Listen, it's so good to hear your voice when you're singing. It's so good to hear your voice when you go, when you commit yourself to getting the gospel to people. I want to tell you the angels of heaven are rejoicing because it's so wonderful when you can give a gospel track out and engage somebody in a gospel conversation. And the Lord in heaven says, it's so good to hear your voice. And you can imagine that when you and I get to heaven, when you and I get to heaven, we're going to get there. And one day the Lord's going to greet us and say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You know what my response is going to be? Lord, it's so good to hear your voice. It's so good to hear the voice of people that are excited about the Lord. It's so good to hear the voice of people that want to sing to the Lord and shout it out loud. It's so good to hear the voice of people who tell others about Jesus Christ. It's so good to hear the voice of people who hold the scriptures and read the scriptures out loud. It's so good to hear the voice of little children as they're given scriptures, they're taught to memorize the word of God. And parents, I want to encourage you, encourage your children to memorize the word of God and say it out loud. I imagine they said, it's so good to hear your voice. Brother and sister in Christ, I want to encourage you this morning, don't be a silent voice. Don't be someone that you're not saying anything for Jesus. You go all week long, and you've gone from Sunday to Sunday. You haven't said a thing for Jesus, and you haven't been to your time of prayer, and you haven't told the Lord what's going on. The only time you see God is when you have a problem. I'm going to tell you, our God loves you so much and loves me so much. I think about the name John, Jehovah's Gracious. You know what God says? He doesn't, he doesn't condemn us. He doesn't judge us on that. He just says, it's so good to hear your voice. It's so good to hear your voice. And so he praises God. And so we see Zacharias. We see Zacharias, and, who's a skeptic, and Zacharias, who's silent. And we see Zacharias and the son. But notice as we go down a little bit further, we see Zacharias and his sermon. The Bible says in verse 67 that, that his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and he prophesied. Now I've read what some, of the, what some of the writers say about this and a lot of them will tell you that there's two songs in Luke chapter 1. The first song we saw last week, which we know is a song, was the song of Mary. It's called the Magnificat in, in Latin. And Mary's singing, rejoicing about the Lord there. And some will tell you that what Zacharias gives here in verses 67 to 79 is Zacharias' song. And that might be so, but I like what the Bible says itself because the best interpreter for the Bible and the best commentator for the Bible is the Bible itself. And the Bible says here in verse 67, and his father Zacharias was filled with the Holy Ghost and he prophesied, saying, that means he preached. He didn't hold back his gift, and he didn't hold back his calling. That's why Paul told Timothy, Timothy, he says, listen, I want you to remember the laying on of the hands on you. And he said, I want you to stir up the gift of God which is in thee, which was given thee by the, by the laying on of hands. He says, I want you to get up and speak. He says, don't be intimidated by fear, because God has given us the spirit of power and love and a sound mind. And look at Zacharias. He praises God, and he, then he starts preaching. It's amazing when we get faith, what faith will do in our hearts. I don't have a lot of times to tell you a lot about his preaching. Let me tell you a few things before we close. First of all, did you notice down, we go down to verse uh, 70. And the first thing his message does, it gives acknowledgement to the Old Testament prophets. I want you to notice verse 70, please. And he, as he spake by the mouth of his holy prophets, which have been since the world began. I believe the first prophet God had was Abel, God, Adam's son. His blood that he shed speaks on his behalf. We're told that Enoch was a prophet of righteousness, a preacher of righteousness. He preached about the Lord's coming. We've had prophets, we've had preachers since the beginning. And God still blesses and uses the ministry of preaching. Now, you're gonna, there's going to be a day I'm not going to be around here, and some of you are going to be around, and you're going to be talking about things, and you're going to be thinking, we got to reinvent church, and maybe preaching's too long, and preaching's too boring, and all these kind of things. I'm going to tell you something about preaching this morning. God has ordained that he's going to use the foolishness of preaching. We come to church through preaching, through the engine of preaching, we elevate Jesus Christ. 
And through the engine of preaching, you can hear the gospel and get your soul saved. And through the engine of preaching, you learn how to walk with God. Through the engine of preaching, you learn the word of God. Listen, preaching edifies your soul. Preaching builds you up. And listen, it's not the wisdom of this world, but it's the wisdom of God that comes to us through preaching. And so God, God says here about Zacharias, he starts talking about the prophets of old and how God gave them these prophets there to fulfill God's love through his covenant. But then he talked about a second prophet. Go with me over to verses 76 to 78. And the second prophet he talks about is that son that was born of Elizabeth. He calls John the Baptist the prophet of the highest. You know what happens in, in his heart? He is saying out loud in his sermon, I believe what God wrote in Isaiah 40 and Malachi chapter 3 and 4 about this son who had come in the spirit and the power of Elias this son would come as the forerunner of the Lord and prepare the way of the Lord. And he knew in his heart, because he knew Bible timelines and chronology, he knew that John was now born, and it wasn't long after that Jesus would be born. And he knew that now Jesus would come in his lifetime, the Messiah, the anointed one, the one who was prophesied in Isaiah 7, 14, and Isaiah 9, 6, has that now will be here, and he's coming during my lifetime, and he's coming to die for my sins. And Isaiah 53 would be fulfilled where he would be wounded for our transgression, he would be bruised for our iniquities, the chastisement of our peace would be upon him, and by his stripes we will be healed. All we like sheep have gone astray, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Talk about the prophet of that generation. How John the Baptist would shake that generation. He would declare to the people that they need to repent towards God and get their hearts ready for the coming of the Lord. And he would turn the hearts of the fathers to the son and the sons to the father. He talked about the Old Testament prophets. He talked about the contemporaneous prophet. But he talked about a greater prophet too. And the greater prophet he's talking about here that consumes all of this message is a prophet who is not just a prophet. He was also prophet, priest, and king. He was a prophet who has an endless life, a prophet who has no beginning and who has no end, who the Bible declares he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, a prophet who is the way, the truth, and the life, the prophet who the Bible says the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant. This prophet is known other than our Lord Jesus Christ. An endless prophet, a perpetual prophet, a perfect prophet, a prophet who wins the word of God. The word was with us and dwelt among us, and he's the, the word of God. And the consummation of his entire message was about Jesus. The consummation of what a Bible preaching church should be doing is preaching about Jesus. And you'll notice here he speaks about Jesus. And we go back to the early part of the sermon there. And we go right there to verse 68. And the first thing he speaks about is Jesus and his payment. He uses that word redeemed. To be bought out of the slave market. Those days you'd go to the marketplace and if you wanted to buy helpers, they called them slaves. Slaves are not good. It's just what it was in those days. And a man would take 30 pieces of silver and he said, I want this one. And he'd give the 30 pieces of silver to the, mer the merchant and the merchant would hand over the slave to him. The slave became his property. Over time, that man would let the slave have freedom that he didn't have before. The slave was thankful to be bought out of the marketplace. Let me tell you, Jesus Christ, when he came to earth and died for your sins and mine, he shed his precious, sinless blood on your behalf and mine. He bought us with his own blood. He bought you and I out of the slave market of sin. His shed blood paid the entire expensive price, the exorbitant price that was necessary to buy, pay out your sin debt, to buy, pay your sin debt in full. He's bought us with his own blood. Listen, salvation is not cheap. You are bought by the blood of Jesus Christ. He not only uses the word redemption, but we go down a little bit further, and notice he uses the word remission there in verse 77. The word remission takes us back to Leviticus 17, I think. The Day of Atonement, or Leviticus 16. High priest would take two goats with him, and on the Day of Atonement, he would play over both goats, and the first one they would take, and they would slay that goat and take the blood with hyssop and sprinkle it on, on, the, on the Holy of Holies. They'd sprinkle it there upon the Ark of the Covenant for the, for the covering, the sprinkling of blood represented that the shed blood would atone for the sins of the people. Then he would take the second goat and he would pray over that goat again. He would take the goat and he would take it out into the wilderness and let the goat go and it would go away free. And there, that's where we get our word remission. Remission means to send away. 
When you get saved, let me tell you this morning, your sins are forgiven, your sins are sent away. Their sins and remembrance, I'll remember no, their sins and iniquities, I'll remember no more. Your sins are gone away. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far God forgives us our sins. The east and west never mean. My friend, this morning, if you're struggling about the forgiveness of sins, the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, has cleansed us from all sin. Jesus and his payment, Jesus and his power. Notice in verse um, 69. And he's raised up for us a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. He sees the fulfilling of prophecy. He's preaching about prophecy. He's preaching about Jesus. Horns are representations of power and victory. The picture in verse 69 of the army that's taken captive, they're helpless and weak. Help comes. That help defeats the enemy. The enemy's overcome. No longer will anybody be taken captive. No longer the under oppression. The enemy's defeated. Our victory's complete. That's Jesus and his power. He is able to keep you from falling. He's, he takes you by the hand. Listen, once you're saved, you're always saved. You cannot lose your salvation. Listen, there's the power of Jesus Christ to keep you close to himself and to keep you in his love and to, get, to know that you're accepted in the beloved. We have Jesus and his power. Thank God for the horn of salvation. But notice we see Jesus and his performance. Look at the last few verses and we're done. He says, through the tender mercy, verse 78, through the tender mercy of our God, whereby the day spring from on high has visited us to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. Now here he's talking about the Jews as a whole, but we can apply this individually. Isaiah wrote about the Jews being a people that sat in darkness, and that's what he's talking about here. For all this time, the Jews have sat in darkness, waiting for the Messiah to come. And he says when Jesus comes, he'll be like the sun rising up in the morning. One of my, my favorite time of the day is the sun rising up. It's, it's daylight when the sun starts to come up. I love when we go away to certain places there where you can catch the sunrise, and you see the sun coming in the morning. I love to get up right before the sun comes. It's still very dark, but as the sun comes up, there's something about it. And he's saying, Jesus Christ, if you would, is the son of righteousness with healing in his wings and he's the sun rising in the day and here's what he's telling us listen no matter how dark your situation may be no matter how dark your sin life was be when you got saved he brought you out of darkness into light and when he saved you he brought daylight into your life this I know that the weeping endureth for the night but the Bible says joy cometh in the morning and when there's a sun rising up every day listen the sun comes up every morning when the sun comes up he comes up with Jesus because he has healing in his wings he gives light where there's darkness. He takes you out of this pathway where you feel like you're in a fog and not sure where you're going. And he says, he guides our feet into the way of peace. Thank God that it's new with Jesus Christ. You're a new creature in Jesus Christ. You have a new beginning in Jesus Christ. You have a new name in Jesus Christ. You have a new life in Jesus Christ. You have a new destiny in Jesus Christ. Everything becomes new. That's his performance. He's the day spring from on high. He didn't die for your sins and calling you to calling him as to be saved and to keep you in darkness. No, he's the sun that rises up in our soul. He's the son of righteousness who is healing in his wings. You take that word day spring, you go over the book of Revelation, he talks about the morning star. Jesus is our morning star. He's our sunrise. He's the sun that comes up every morning. In his performance, he lifts your burdens. He carries your griefs. He's acquainted with your griefs and he's acquainted with your sorrows. There's no sorrow he cannot bear. There's no grief that he cannot absorb. There's no burden he cannot carry. Casting all your care upon him for he careth for you because he's the day spring from on high. He's the light where there's no darkness. That's why I love what it says in the book of Revelation. It says in heaven, we don't need, we don't need any other light. Jesus is the light of heaven. There's no darkness in heaven. There's no darkness in Jesus.
You may have darkness in your life right now, and you may be in a dark place, but he's the day spring from on high that puts light in your situation. He's the light of the world. And beyond that, he's the light of the universe. To give light that we might find our way of peace. Zacharias, it's so good to hear your voice. So good to hear your voice, Zacharias. I encourage you this morning. God wants to hear your voice. Do you know for sure you're saved? If you were to die today, do you know for certain that you're going to heaven? If you were to die right now, did you know that if, you don't have, if you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you could spend all of eternity separated from God, and that's not where God wants you to go? But the Bible says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in the heart God's raised from the dead, thou shalt be saved. You can be saved this morning. Today our church and this pastor gives you an invitation to receive Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, that the sun would rise in your heart, the salvation would be yours. You could have the remission of sins and receive that redemption that he's already accomplished for you. As a Christian, have you been like Zacharias? You've been living in disbelief. You've been silent. You've been on the sidelines, powerless. The words that are said is unable and cannot. But when you have faith in God, he loosens your tongue and he opens your mouth. When you have faith, nothing can impede faith. You must have faith. You're living in disbelief. You're going to get harder and harder and harder. I encourage you this morning. It's a sin to be live in disbelief, but it's fellowship with our Lord when you're walking in faith. Trust and obey, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus than to trust and obey. I think a lot of us this morning need to get up out of our seats and exercise some faith. He wants to hear your voice. He wants to hear your voice in witnessing. He wants to hear your voice in singing. He wants to hear your voice in praising. He wants to hear your voice in prayer. He wants you to hear a voice in kindness. He wants you to be like Zacharias. You stand up and say something about Jesus Christ that brings others to him. It's so good to hear your voice. Will the Lord hear your voice today? Let's stand. Father, thank you this morning for the life of Zacharias.